In this video, I'm going to show you 10 Bible verses that disprove Calvinism and why I believe that Calvinism is unbiblical. And I'm also going to share how Calvinists will explain these verses and why they're wrong and how they interpret the Bible. Hi, my name is David Cipriano. I'm a youth pastor who wants to teach the Bible to as many people as possible. I believe that Calvinism is one of the most dangerous false teachings of Christianity. So dangerous that it is causing people to go to hell. And because of that, I am very passionate about teaching against Calvinism. And before I share the verses that disprove Calvinism, I just want to give a really quick overview of what Calvinism is. Calvinism is summarized through five points that make the acrostic tulip. The T stands for total depravity. This means that because of the fall of man, we're dead in trespasses and sins, unable to save ourselves. Now this is true, but Calvinists will go even further to explain that we're so totally depraved that we're unable to choose Christ. See, a non-Calvinist says that since we're dead in sin, then we need to believe the gospel. But a Calvinist says that since we're dead in sin, then we're not able to believe the gospel unless we've been predestinated by God. The U stands for unconditional election. This is the most distinctive teaching of Calvinism, and it's the belief that in eternity past, God and his sovereignty unconditionally elected certain people to salvation. But a major problem with this is that for God to only choose some to be saved, then he consequently chose everybody else to be lost. The L in TULIP stands for limited atonement. Now to me, this is the worst and most unbiblical teaching of Calvinism. It teaches that Jesus didn't die for the world, but rather the predestinated elect, meaning that he died for some, but not for all. The I stands for irresistible grace. Calvinists teach that when God has elected or predestined someone, then they automatically and irresistibly respond, meaning that God forces the elect to come to him. This belief takes away the free will of man, and as we'll see later, there's some very clear scriptures that show that God's grace is resistible. And finally, the P stands for perseverance of the saints, meaning that those elected by God will persevere in faith until the end, and that Christians will never lose their salvation. So if someone is genuinely a Christian, then they'll continue to believe in Christ and live a life of obedience. It may seem similar to eternal security or once saved, always saved, but it's not the same. Now, some Calvinists will say that they don't believe in all five points of tulip, they just believe in some of them. And maybe you've heard someone describe themselves as a three or four point Calvinist, but personally I believe in none of these points because I believe from the Bible that Calvinism as a whole is unbiblical and false. And we're going to look at 10 Bible verses that disprove Calvinism. And with each of these scriptures, I'm going to show you how Calvinists explain these verses. 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This verse is very clear. God does not want for anybody to perish or to go to hell. He wants for all people to come to him in repentance. Limited atonement teaches that Christ only died for those who would believe, and unconditional election teaches that God only pre-selected certain people to be saved, but these points contradict 2 Peter 3 9 because God wants for all to be saved, not willing that any should perish. Now when Calvinists are confronted with this verse, they'll say that the any refers to any of the elect, and that all refers to all of the elect. But when you read through the context of this verse and this chapter, that is not implied anywhere. And when you read this verse without any presuppositions, it doesn't really make sense why that would be the case. Because without any bias you would not have thought that it was just about any of the elect or all of the elect. You would just interpret it as any or all, period. One of the biggest problems with Calvinism is that it forces you to read all of scripture with a Calvinistic bias rather than just simply taking the word for what it says, meaning that you have to constantly reinterpret certain verses or certain passages to make them fit Calvinism. And we see this trend in the next verse as well, 
well, which you've probably heard before. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. This means all people, regardless of what they've done or haven't done. And the Bible says a lot about God's love in verses like Romans 5, 8, 1 John 3, 16, and 1 John 4, 9. God's love is unconditional, but in the Calvinist view, God has only selected some people to be able to be saved, meaning that he consequently chose everybody else to be lost. And Calvinists will often fight back when you say that, saying that God doesn't choose some to be lost. But if God was really only choosing a select few to be able to be saved, then that's exactly what he'd be doing. And if God was disallowing some to be saved, then he would not be a loving God, but a hateful God. You might say that he was loving to the elect, but he certainly wouldn't be loving as a whole. Now Calvinists will interpret John 3.16 a couple different ways, and they both revolve around how you would interpret world. Some will say that world is not referring to all of the world, but rather just the world of the elect. Again, adding meaning to the Bible to make it fit your beliefs. Others will say that world is just a general reference to humanity and that it should not be implied that it means every single human who has ever lived. But both of those views are wrong because world should be viewed as all people everywhere. And this next verse further supports that. For there is no respect of persons with God, meaning that God is just and that he doesn't judge people with prejudice or special treatment. God doesn't judge based on outward appearance, ethnicity, financial status, etc. He is just and unbiased, and he treats all people with love and kindness. So it doesn't make sense that this same God would only die for some, but not for all, and that he would reject many from being able to accept the gospel. Calvinists will argue that God chooses and elects based on his sovereignty and grace, not based on respect of persons, and that God's choice and election is not about partiality, but rather a mystery to us. But this doesn't really explain how an impartial and just God is forcing some to be saved and forcing others to be lost for no real reason. If God is truly a just, impartial judge, then why would he be randomly selecting some to be saved and others to go to hell? God is not a respecter of persons, meaning that the Calvinistic teachings of unconditional election and limited atonement cannot be true and biblical. Now, I believe that this next verse might be the hardest verse for Calvinists to explain, and he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's it's very clear that Jesus didn't just die for some, he died for all. He is a propitiation or the substitutionary payment for the sins of the whole world. Now Calvinists will try to say that the whole world is a reference to the whole world of the elect, but if that's true, then who is being referred to in the phrase, not for ours only? They may say that it's about the people being written to in the letter, but an impartial reader of the Bible wouldn't come to that conclusion. This this verse is very clear that Jesus didn't just die for some, he died for all. He did not just sacrifice his life for the elect or for the church, but for all of humanity, even for the ones who would not receive him. Now Calvinists will teach that God has only drawn the elect to him, and that lost people are lost because they haven't been drawn to him, and they'll use verses like John 6:44 out of context to say this. They'll say that you could only accept Christ if you've been drawn to him. But in John 12, 32, Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus here is declaring that we were all drawn to him when he was lifted up on the cross. Not just the elect, but all of humanity. And because of his death for the whole world, then we're all invited to receive him for the salvation of our sins. Now Calvinists may say that all men refers to all of the elect, or that this is about every knee bowing to him and every tongue confessing him as Lord as referenced in Philippians 2. But again, a person without any biases would not have come to that conclusion by just simply reading the Bible. Calvinists have to write between the lines to make the Bible fit their worldview. Now a major emphasis of Calvinist teaching is the sovereignty of God. And while the Bible does affirm God's sovereignty, Calvinists will overemphasize it
it to the point of denying the free will of man. But here's a story from the Old Testament that illustrates man's free will and salvation. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now this is one of the clearest pictures of the gospel in the Old Testament, and it's even mentioned by Jesus in John 3. Here, the people had been bitten by a serpent, and they had to look at the fiery serpent on the pole to be healed. And the people had the choice to look at the serpent or not. If they chose to look, they'd be saved. If they chose to not look, they'd die. Now Calvinists may say that provisionists or Arminians are looking too much into the story, and that it's a picture of the gospel, but you shouldn't read too much into it. But the reason why this story and this picture are so important is because looking at the snake was a choice. Without there being a choice, the story kind of falls apart and has no real meaning. The truth is that salvation and accepting the gospel is a choice. And just like how the Israelites had to choose to look or to not look at the snake, we today have to choose to accept Christ or reject him. And people have the chance to accept or reject Christ when we follow this command from Jesus in the next verse. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now why would Jesus be telling us to preach the gospel to every creature if not everybody can be saved? And what would be the purpose in declaring the gospel to people who weren't allowed to receive it? Now Calvinists will say that the reason why we need to declare the gospel to everybody is because we don't know who is and who isn't elect. And this could make sense except for the fact that irresistible grace implies the elect will be saved no matter what. And if the elect will be saved no matter what, then we wouldn't need to evangelize. And when you mention this to a Calvinist, they'll say that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and that for people to be saved, then they first have to hear the gospel. And I agree with this, but it contradicts with Calvinism, because if God's grace is truly irresistible, then it shouldn't be dependent on Christians sharing the gospel with the world. And on that note, here's a couple more Bible verses that disprove irresistible grace. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Calvinists believe that once God has elected a person, then they will automatically and irresistibly respond, and that they have no choice because God is sovereign. But in this verse, God is speaking to people that he wanted to save, but they wouldn't accept him, showing that God's grace is in fact resistible, because God will not force anybody to love him or accept him. We all have a free will, and we can use that free will to either accept Jesus or reject him. And we see another example of resisting God in Acts 7:51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Now Calvinists will say that people resist the Holy Spirit because in their natural state as sinners, they hate God, and that grace must be irresistible because we reject God in our total depravity. But it's key to realize that these unbelievers in the verse are being confronted for their unbelief. Now if they weren't able to accept God, then why would they be condemned for rejecting him? Because under Calvinism, they have no choice but to reject him. The biblical truth is that God offers his salvation to all the world, and he doesn't want for anybody to reject this gift, but sadly most people do out of their unbelief. If you'd like to learn more about Calvinism and why I disagree with it, here's a video that further explains each of the five points and why I believe that each of them are in biblical. And if you're a Calvinist, I'd love to hear how you would explain these verses, and if you thought I was fair in how I represented your beliefs. Thanks for watching and subscribe for more Bible studies like this one.